All right, in this video, we want to discuss two <clears throat> particularly common sources of infections, and those are carriers and vectors. So we want to define what these terms mean and, and give some concrete examples of them. So let's start with carriers. Uh, so a carrier is an individual who inconspicuously shelters a pathogen and spreads it to others. So a carrier is a person who we cannot tell has a disease-causing microbe on or in them, but they can spread it to other people. So this is the very specific meaning of this term carrier, a person that can give another person a disease without obviously being infected with that disease. So there are two major types of carriers, and we'll call them active carriers and passive carriers. So we'll give an example or examples of each. Active will actually have several subtypes. So let's start with an active carrier. So again, a carrier is a person who can transmit a disease-causing microbe because they have that microbe in or on them. So an active carrier is someone who is or was infected, but does not show any signs or symptoms. So if we just look at a person, we can't tell that they have the disease. The person themselves may not feel that they have the disease, but that microbe is or was in the past actively growing inside them. They were infected. So this can happen multiple times during the progression of an infection. So we've talked about previously about <clears throat> the stages of infection. And so let's think about the different times during an infection that someone could harbor the disease-causing microbe and pass it on to someone else without showing symptoms. So the first way that this can happen is that someone could be actively infected. They could be in the height of the infection, but they just could be asymptomatic. So here's an image demonstrating this woman who is jumping rope because she feels perfectly healthy. She's not coughing or sneezing or doesn't have any other outward signs or symptoms, um, but she may be infected with a disease-causing microbe and could be transmitting it. Uh, right now, asymptomatic carriers are very important because we are quite concerned about asymptomatic carriers transmitting the coronavirus. It is thought that there are many people who don't develop any symptoms but are infected and while they are infected, can transmit that virus. So an asymptomatic carrier, someone who's actively infected without symptoms, is one way that a person could transmit a disease-causing microbe without showing signs or symptoms of that disease. Another time during the progression of an infection that people can transmit a disease-causing microbe without showing signs or symptoms is during the incubation period. So we've talked about how during the incubation period, the microbe is making its way to the part of the body where it will grow. And it's not uh, reproducing at high numbers yet. Um, during that incubation period, we might not feel any signs or symptoms, but an individual could harbor the pathogen, the disease causing microbe, in a way that could get passed to another person. So the incubation period often is symptom and sign free, and that's a time when people can transmit pathogens. If we think about later in the progression of disease, um, there's also the convalescent period. So as a person is getting better from an illness, they may still harbor the disease causing microbes, perhaps in just such small numbers, that they're no longer causing damage to the point where we observe signs or symptoms, but a person who is convalescing might still harbor the microbe and be able to pass it on to another person. And this can happen during the period of convalescence when there is no, there are no more remaining signs or symptoms. <clears throat> Finally, after convalescence, it is possible for some diseases for a person to be completely healthy once again, but to be chronically infected. 
So in a chronic infection, you might go through the normal disease progression and have all the signs and symptoms and have the disease for a period of time. But after you heal, you retain some of those disease-causing microbes in small numbers. They're no longer causing tissue damage, so you don't get signs or symptoms. But a chronic, a person with a chronic infection, lacking signs or symptoms, can still shed that disease-causing microbe and potentially transmit it to someone giving them the disease. So those are all the ways that someone can be an active carrier, where the microbe did, is or did, infect that person. The microbe is alive in their body or on their body, actively reproducing, even if it's in very small numbers. And that is how the person can transmit that microorganism. So now let's think about a passive carrier. So passive carriers are individuals who are not infected, but they transport a disease-causing microbe. And so the example we'll use for passive carriers are healthcare workers. A healthcare worker like this nurse might interact with a patient who has a pathogen, a disease-causing microbe in or on their body, and that disease-causing microbe might contaminate a healthcare worker. This person does not, in this instance, become infected. This nurse does not get sick with this disease-causing microbe. But rather, in their daily workflow, perhaps they leave the room with this patient, they are contaminated with this disease-causing microbe, and then they go to another room with a second patient, and they interact with that patient and it's possible for them to transmit the disease-causing microbe to the second patient. This person become, can become infected and ill. Again, the passive carrier never becomes infected. They are quite simply just a transport vehicle for the pathogen. So active carriers are infected. The microorganism is growing inside those people causing disease, in some cases without signs or symptoms. Passive carriers are not infected. Basically, all a passive carrier does is pick up a disease-causing pathogen and then put it down in a new place or on a new person. So those are carriers. We want to end this video by talking about vectors. So we want to clearly define how carriers and vectors are different. So again, a carrier, a carrier is a human who transmits a disease-causing microbe, right? So carrier always refers to humans. Vectors, on the other hand, are non-human animals. So vectors are also animals that transmit disease, they're just non-human animals. So we use the term carrier to refer to humans that transmit disease, and we, refer, we use the term vectors to refer to non-human animals that transmit disease. So let's think more about these non-human animals that transmit disease-causing microbes. So most commonly, the animals that transmit disease are arthropods. <clears throat> the arthropods include mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, and other insects. So arthropods are by far the most common vector but they're not the only vectors. So other animals can also be vectors. For example, bats. Bats are in the conversation right now, once again, uh, associated with coronavirus. It's thought that a bat originally infected a person with the coronavirus and then the virus began infecting other people. Uh, dogs, for example, a, a dog infected with rabies could be a vector that transmits the rabies virus. So again, vectors are the animals that are transmitting a disease-causing microbe. Mostly arthropods, but some other animals as well. We're going to talk about two types of vectors. So there's going to be mechanical vectors and biological vectors. So let's think about those specific categories and what differentiates them. We'll begin with a mechanical vector. So mechanical vectors are animals that transport a disease-causing microbe without 
being infected. If we think about that definition, this is really similar to a passive carrier. Again, our example of a passive carrier was a nurse who becomes contaminated with a disease-causing microbe and moves that disease-causing microbe to a second patient, and then that second patient becomes infected. Mechanical vectors are just animals that do the exact same thing. Mechanical vectors are animals that pick up a disease-causing microbe in one spot and put it down in another spot. That new spot exposes a human to the pathogen and that human can become ill. So let's think about a concrete example of a mechanical vector. The most common example is a fly. So here's a common experience for a fly. Flies might be flying around in a park and at one point the fly will land on a pile of feces. So we've all seen flies crawling around on feces. Feces is contaminated with bacteria. The flies appendages, their legs are touching the feces and bacteria from the feces could end up stuck to the fly's leg. The fly might then fly around and maybe if we're having a picnic, a fly might land on our food. So now it's possible for those pathogenic microorganisms that were present in feces to be deposited directly onto our food. The fly just picked up some pathogens from the feces, put them down on our food, and if a picnic goer eats that food, they could become ill with that microorganism. The fly itself was never infected. The fly never got sick. All the fly did was pick up a pathogen and put a pathogen down. And that is the definition of a mechanical vector, an animal that moves a pathogen from one place to another, exposing humans. So now let's think about a biological vector. So biological vectors are animals that are actively infected with a disease-causing microbe. So these are more like our active carriers. In a bio, for a biological vector, the biological vector itself, the animal, is part of the pathogen's life cycle. If the pathogen never made its way into this animal, it probably wouldn't be able to transmit to other places or mature completely. So the most common example of a biological vector <clears throat> is the mosquito, specifically in its relationship with malaria, the malaria parasite. And so this image gives a very brief example of the malaria parasite's life cycle. Okay, so an infected mosquito, so this mosquito is um, infected with the malaria parasite in, in um, bites an uninfected person. And that during that bite, the malaria parasite gets into the person. Inside the person, there's a very complex set of steps involved in the malaria life cycle. It goes to red blood cells and to the liver. Um, but eventually, the parasite matures to a form that can then be picked up by another mosquito that bites this person. So a mosquito deposits the parasites. A mosquito extracts some parasites. This second mosquito now becomes infected. And there is a critical part of the malaria pathogen's life cycle that occurs in the mosquito. Um, in fact, humans can't give other humans malaria. The only way a person can get malaria is if they are bitten by a mosquito that is infected with malaria. And it's because the malaria parasite has to mature. It has to grow inside of that mosquito. So again, that fact that the mosquito itself is infected, the pathogen is growing inside the mosquito, is what makes the mosquito a biological vector in this case. So we'll end there. As always, please let me know if you have any questions, and I will talk to you all again very soon.